Hello, and welcome to the 150th episode of FinTech Impact. I'm your host, Jason Pereira. Today, for this momentous occasion, we're fortunate enough to have Bill Winterberg, founder of FPPAD. Bill is a very well-known expert in the areas of advisor and fintech. And I brought him on the show to have a conversation about the current state of affairs and where things are going and just have a friendly chat. And with that, here's my interview with Bill Winterberg. Hello, Bill. Hello, Jason. <laughs> Thanks for taking the time today. It's my pleasure. So Bill Winterberg, founder of FPPAD.com. Tell us about FPPAD. FPPAD is essentially my website and my online presence. And I started that around 2008 to be a destination and a free destination, free resource for financial professionals to find information and resources on all things technology in the domain of providing financial advice. So I have operated that for the better part of 11 and 12 years to be free, to be that resource for financial advisors and financial professionals to figure out what exists in their technology ecosystem and what they can do to identify tools and resources to solve problems inside their own business and managing their own internal operations, but also take advantage of opportunities when they engage in client-facing activities. So that's been something that I've built and has been my business. And it's evolved over the years to, from its origins as a website and a blog to include podcast content. And then around 2013, 2014, regular video content that mm -hmm. you'll find on the FBPAD YouTube channel. And we've now have created hundreds and hundreds of videos on the topic of technology for financial professionals. A lot of that includes event coverage as well. So we will highlight events where different software companies are developing solutions, hosting events and conferences, or even hackathons. And we capture what is happening in those events and during those hackathon activities, which all benefits the financial mm -hmm. advisor activity, but it gives advisors a, an inside look at who are the movers and shakers? What are they doing? Who are their people that are creating these types of programs, softwares, apps, you name it? And what can advisors kind of glean from that as they look at their own technology roadmap for the future? So that's what FPPAD is in a nutshell. It's just been something I've built over the last 11 and 12 years for the benefit of financial professionals. And it's a fantastic resource. I mean, a lot of times, you know, the concept of technology can be overwhelming to people, especially when it comes to fintech. A lot of it can seem almost adversarial because you're in competition with it. I'd say you're an early innovator and we'll call call the digital advisor or you know the cyborg advisor using technology to their benefit to to basically improve our practices. And you've been a wonderful resource to to countless people in that regard. And I thank you for that. So Tell me about your history. So before you became a financial advisor and then eventually you did a PPAD, tell me what you did before that in the entire journey. Before I got into financial services and FPPAD, I was, believe it or not, a software engineer. I grew up in the Silicon Valley of California, so I guess fortunate to be born there and grow up there. Gee, you and Steve Jobs, just like lucky like that. <laughs> We're like, you can't see us on video, but I'm doing the whole, my fingers are crossed. Steve yeah. Jobs and I are just like this. You know, I lived uh, 10 or 12 miles from his place in Palo Alto. So yeah, we're, we're best buddies. <laughs> so I grew up in the early 80s and 90s when I started cutting my teeth on going to the Fry's Electronics and buying motherboards and controller cards and sound blasters and putting those all together to create our own 286, 386 computer and running software on that. And out of that, I had some connections in my immediate network to work on projects at Hewlett Packard. So my first real job outside of some sales jobs at, uh, and we'll do a bonus quiz for your listeners later. Mm -hmm. My first sales jobs were at uh, Montgomery Ward's Electric Avenue, as well oh as boy. Circuit City. So that goes deep for those who are taking the quiz who want bonus points. There's no CE available, but... You know, it's funny. The Montgomery Ward Electric Avenue is one that I hear referenced quite frequently by the guys on um, This Week in Tech. <laughs> they seem to reference the old days of going to that shop quite often. So yeah, you, you, were, you, were prob yeah, you probably the, served Leo at one point. The movers and shakers have their origins go. in Electric Avenue. Yeah. So I worked at Hewlett Packard for about two and a half years on a really large project with their uh, printers and their Jet Direct division. And again, just because of my network in the uh, South Bay area, I got another phone call 
through a resource. And I have to, I have to admit, this was my girlfriend at the time who I have now married and I'll be celebrating our 20 year anniversary this month. But it was through her connection. Uh, she babysat for a gentleman running a small startup company in the electronic educational toy space. He called me and he was aware that I was going to college. I was just like a freshman or sophomore in college for electrical engineering learning about software engineering as well as audio engineering. Because my dream, here's quiz question number two, my dream when I was 18 was to run the sound boards and the audio boards on cruise ships for their entertainment so that I could do that on the cruise ship and then be in different ports and see the world. So when I was 18, that was the dream. But because I was studying for audio engineering, that gentleman contacted me and says, how would you like to work on our instruments and our audio for this electronic educational toy? That toy became the LeapPad learning system by a company called LeapFrog Toys. And it essentially created the electronic educational toy market in 1998 and 1999. I ended up working with LeapFrog for about seven and a half years until uh, 2005. And LeapFrog did go public. I believe it was in the summer of 2001. I was fortunate enough to have some stock options. And because of that, all of us as employees would get cold calls from brokerage houses. Hey, congratulations on the IPO. We want to help you out. And for some reason, I would answer that call and it's like, I feel like these guys don't really care about me and who I am, especially at the age of, you know, 22 or something like that. And for some reason, had this little seed planted in my brain that maybe this isn't in my best interest. So I started to self-educate on taxes, options, and things like that, and talk about that openly and honestly with my coworkers. And that was the formation of this idea of, boy, maybe there's something to financial advice and financial planning and not having a sales agenda. So in 2005, LeapFrog was unfortunately not having any successful follow-on products to the Uh learning system. So I was caught in a round of layoffs in 2005, but I also kind of had one foot out the door. My wife transitioned and went to medical school and was living across the country. We were, I was flying Uh back and forth between California and Maryland twice a month and it was tough. Uh, So I already had one foot out the door and I looked introspectively and it's like, what can I do that is satisfying for myself and feels like something that I want to do for the next 10 years, knowing that having a good clue that my wife is maybe moving a couple more times. So I can't do something that would like permanently lock me in place geographically from a skill set perspective. And so that thing happened to be financial advice and financial planning. So in 2005, I kind of made the switch away from software engineering after doing it for about 10 years and learned about the Financial Planning Association. I learned about the Mm -hmm. certified financial planner designation. And through those years, through 2005 through 2009, got a job at a brokerage firm, got my Series 7, realized Mm -hmm. in nine months after that, that brokerage (laughs) environment is probably not for me. Was not for you, yes. And then discovered the fee-only financial advisor, uh, nomenclature, discovered NAPFA, the Mm -hmm. North American Personal Financial Fee-Only Association. I butchered that, so maybe we'll delete that in. It's a tough acronym. No, it's it's all right. (laughs) They need to fix it. (laughs) You heard it here. Well, you're here second. But yes, I discovered (laughs) NAPFA and fee-only and then was able to start up my own individual investment firm while I moved to Oregon, also found a firm that I could run operations for. And that was a good moment for me to combine what I had done for 10 years in software engineering, and then identify operational efficiencies that could be put in place into this firm, but it was Mm -hmm. provide fee-only financial planning. So I learned a lot about just the business of portfolio management, doing fee billing on a quarterly basis, and what real clients want in terms of their engagement with their planners, and what types of resources can back up those planners from an operational and technology perspective. So... In 2009, we had another move in our household away from Oregon to Dallas, Texas. And that was my opportunity to say, look, I I did some great work for two years inside this firm, but I'm ready to do this professionally on my own nationwide basis. And that's when I started Mm -hmm. FPPAD. So those are all the origins, plus those two quiz questions for those listeners who are listening in. Hilarious. And there will be a quiz in the uh, in the show notes. <laughs> anyway, that said, so when you started off working for, let's say, getting away from the brokerage firm, going to the financial planning firm, the state of affairs in terms of technology, how would you describe it? How painful was it back in those days? Well, it was pretty painful. This was 2006, 2007. So things yeah. like Redtail CRM were in their infancy. 
you know, here oh, we are in 2020 and they're pushing 15, 16 years in business, maybe a little bit more. But advisors were hesitant to use the cloud, right? There was a lot of concern mm-hmm. over yep. security with respect to the cloud in 2006, 2007. So we were still using server-based software. The uh, Morningstar Principia would come on CD-ROMs. You would oh, install that on your local server. And when you close the doors at 5 p.m. or 6 p.m., nobody had access to email, to Principia. Nobody had access to the CRM. It was all in that host, not hosted server. I can't local say hosted. Yeah. yeah, in that <laughs> local on-premise server. That was the way that businesses operated in 2006 and 2007. But within two years, by early 2009 and late 2008, You were seeing a proliferation and growth in the cloud options, particularly Mm -hmm. the CRM options. Redtail was really Mm -hmm. starting to add, as one example, a lot of clients. Uh, You were starting to get these IT companies doing hosted instances of Portfolio Center for portfolio management. And Mm -hmm. so that was really the early stages of getting things off of the advisor's local server and on-premise server and moving it to the cloud. And so comfort was starting to grow. There were certainly a lot of security articles about good practices with respect to your security hygiene and protecting your information. But that was the early stage at that progression. And then what happened with the confluence of comfort with cloud computing, as well as the downward movement in the markets in late 2008 and early 2009, advisors were forced to do more with less. Uh, Their budgets for technology were constrained, but the cloud and hosting solutions was a possible was a possible avenue to consider to operate more efficiently and do more with less and be better with your technology spending and your technology budget. Yeah, your timing is interesting there because, I mean, you're talking 2006, 2007. Just so happens a little company or division called AWS was founded in 2006, right? So when you're talking about the proliferation or the early days of the cloud, you're right. And they were the spark that set off the powder keg, right? So not surprising that you were there almost the seminal moment where it all got started. Right. And not to mention Salesforce from that CRM uh, perspective. Absolutely. That was about that time where they started to become a player in sales management and then just general CRM platform as a service. And this concept of, wait a minute, I'm going to pay for it monthly instead of just for a licensing fee and have it sit on my server. Like the early innovation of the SaaS model also changed the game because you go back before that period, you were talking about large scale, multi-thousand dollar deployments every time you wanted to do something to pay for an annual license versus, okay, wait a sec, I'm paying a subscription fee and dropping the the actual implementation cost to do so. That, again, 2008 may have had something to do, kind of of push people into that kind of cost-centered mind mind space, but it was a win-win for everybody across the board. I agree that you used to buy software with this huge upfront lump sum purchase, and then what was your subscription? Your subscription was just support, right? You subscribed to support so that you could call somebody and get support with that software. So there's this huge capital outlay that not all firms were in a position to handle. And that transitioned after 2009 to, look, we're going to eliminate this capital outlay. We're going to host your software solution in the cloud. And we're just going to charge you on a monthly basis based on how many seats you need. So you don't need to cut this huge check up front, but you need to plan every month, every Mm -hmm. quarter, every year on what your ongoing spend is going to be for this solution. It really changed things for sure. And it changed the incentive too, because before the incentive was to wait a couple of years, develop a new version of that software and sell the nicely packaged new upgraded version, right? And, you know, some people would wait, there was the old, I'll wait for the every second version of Microsoft Office before I upgrade. People would do that, but it changed the incentive. If you're basically paying on a monthly basis, now you're not worried about large scale deployments. You're worried about constant improvement. And now we all benefit from multiple upgrades per year. So instead of waiting for this massive bulk of like, here's 5,000 things we fixed in this release two years later, we're now basically getting, oh, here's a quarterly release with 12 things fixed. It's like, Fantastic. Yeah. To wrap this up, many of our listeners, I'm sure, recall this story. I went down to Fry's Electronics in the 90s and I picked up a package off the shelf, which was $99 and it was called Windows 95, right? I had to buy it and go home and install it. And then when Windows 2000 comes out, Windows ME comes out and all these iterations, it's like, well, I'm going to see what I can do to stay on 95 and get the most out of my money for it. It's just 
my mind explodes a little bit now that software or operating systems like Windows and Mac OS is air quotes free. There's no charge mm -hmm. anymore. Yep. And all the updates are disseminated <laughs> for free. And there's totally different economic models around that. But look, in 25 years, that's what we used to do, which is mind boggling to reflect upon it. Yeah. And, uh, you know, the, the advisor starting out today will never know that pain, thankfully. Never yourself lucky. Yes. You will not appreciate the struggle it took to get here, unfortunately. But it's, it's both ways in the snow to fries, by the way. <laughs> Uphill in both directions for yeah. that matter. <laughs> so basically, you know, that's kind of where we were to where we are today. So tell me about your current practice as an advisor. I mean, you have to be one of the better digitally organized advisors out there. So Bill, you do a ton of consulting. So specifically around how to better use digital technology to enable the entire client experience. So best practices from what you do, you go in and you overhaul someone's practice. Where do you start? What do you look at? What is the experience if ideally listened to look like end to end by the time you're done? You got two hours for your podcast? Is that what we're allocating? Cole's here? notes. Cole's I, notes. I know. Okay. So to tighten that up, I really spend a lot of time on my intake with an advisor and with a, a firm. What are your challenges today? But also tell me about what your ideal state is going to be within two to three years. I want to understand what you're trying to build for clients, what you're trying to deliver and what type of experience you want to create. And then also tell me about some of the things that are frustrating to you today. What causes angst? What do you feel is already efficient? Where do you feel you can make some improvements in your internal operations and also improvements in the experience that your clients have? That's my line of questions. So if you're, if you're listening, you can kind of back of the envelope, scope that out for your own firm. Just fast forward two to three years, assume that you've made investments and made changes. What does your firm look like? If you're a client, what is the client's experience? Put yourself in the client's shoes. And we kind of get to wave that magic wand in this exercise to explore what your business looks like in the future. And it's my job to try and work backwards from that destination to identify the solutions, the tools, the combinations that I feel are best positioned to work towards that ideal outcome in about two to three years. That's, in a nutshell, what I try to do. So it's not, well, and to fill that out too, I am very receptive to legacy solutions and what exists in the business. A good example is if you're a portfolio center user, which is fairly common for portfolio reporting and portfolio management database purposes, I try to work within the constraints of not requiring a wholesale database conversion to a separate portfolio management solution. So based on that two to three year future horizon, can we engage a service provider? Can we use your existing service provider to get you to that destination in two to three years? Or is there another service provider that basically works on that database infrastructure so you don't require a wholesale mm -hmm. database conversion, but the front end is different. The client experience is different. So you, you're not in Portfolio Center. You're in this layer on top of it from, mm -hmm. a, uh, from a new service provider. I try to work in those types of solutions so that we're not totally overhauling and upending your business. But if that two to three year timeline says, I want this very particular experience and I'm willing to do what it takes to get there, it's like, okay, if you're willing to do what it takes, then I will see if a wholesale database conversion gets you to that position and understand that it's going to take time. It's going to take resources. You're going to have to work at it because it's not going to be the same database that you have today is what you're going to be using in three years. So be prepared to spend work and spend hours making that change. That's in a nutshell what I'm trying to do during my due diligence process and my onboarding process is work through a lot of those exploratory scenarios and also understand where the business is today and how we can effectively make some moves and make some transitions over that two-year to three-year time period. There's a couple of really interesting points I think you hit upon there, and I'll, I'll basically uh, relate this to my experience when I have advisors coming up to me and asking me for advice on what they should be using for X solution. And I, you know, they'll, they'll be like, well, here's a list of them. And then they're like, what a shortcut, what do you use? And my response is universally the same. What I use is irrelevant, right? You're starting from the wrong point. You're thinking the tool, you're looking at the tool as the shiny thing. You're not looking at what is your client experience? Who, what is your client base? What are their needs? And focusing specifically on that. Anything else is basically being done 
for your purposes and not for theirs, right? And they're going to quickly discover that. So it's amazing because people, what's their own devices, will always want the shortcut. But it is a valuable exercise. I think as part of your consulting, I'm sure that there's a lot of kind of mapping of what everything I just discussed is, which is what is the client base? What is the target? What is the experience? What is the, you know, what are these different touch points? How do you want to do that? That you walk them through and Bill is nodding euphorically saying, yes, yes. So that is where anyone who's looking at any kind of digital transformation has to start. The migration piece you mentioned too. I mean, bloody heck, some of these migration costs, it's, it can get expensive, man. So I'm sure they're grateful for you saying, don't just do that. Use my favorite tool now. Let's you basically going in and saying, we can get you about 80, 90% of the way to the new tool if we use something else without getting you to spend tens of thousands of dollars for a couple hundred dollars a month subscription, which I always thought was just weird. <laughs> you know, like they spend this tremendous amount of money in order to spend a smaller amount every month. And then the last piece, and this is a question for you. How much does changing the behavior of the people within the firm present an obstacle? Because especially when you're dealing with people who've been using the same systems for over a decade, introducing, there's got to be a, a kind of a, you know, besides the learning curve of, of learning new software, does that factor into your recommendations? Like, do you basically say, I'm going to switch you from X to Y because of the similarity and the lower learning curve? Like how much is that, does that resonate or does that uh, come to an issue? It is a big issue. So certainly in my intake process, one of my Mm -hmm. more important questions in my mind is, who is the technology champion in your firm? Who is Mm -hmm. that go-to person that helps organize and manage your technology adoption and your technology training? It's, you know, I only have three, three pages more or less in my intake sheet. A lot of it, which is list your existing solutions. How is your firm structured? Do you have a hybrid relationship? Are you fully independent? so on and so forth. But one of those sentinel questions is who in your business is responsible for technology education and technology Mm -hmm. change management? And I will tell you, Jason, when it comes back that the firm owner self-selects him or herself as the technology change person, I am 90% sure that my consulting engagement is going to be an educational exercise. But (laughs) afterwards... (laughs) There yeah. won't be technology yeah. change management. And I, I guarded myself by saying 90%, right? 10% of those yeah. engagements, we're going to get a motivated owner advisor who will affect change. So it's not zero, but it's not a majority. That's one of those questions I think every firm owner needs to ask him or herself, am I trying to take on too much? Am I really the right type of change agent? Because again, as a firm owner, I hope that overwhelming amount of your time is spent thinking about your client experience, engaging with clients and prospecting for new clients and involved in that type of relationship development and business development. And I think it behooves your firm to find somebody that has a skill set as the technology champion. And this is a separate person and it's their full-time job and they have a skill set to study the marketplace, make these recommendations present recommendations to the firm stakeholders and firm owners, but also present the adoption plan and the education plan and how we will affect change management in the business. None of this is about financial planning. None of this is about portfolio management. None of this is about skills that come out of the CFP curriculum programs. So this person may not at all be in the financial services industry. You may be able to, as a listener, you may be able to recruit out of these other industries and ask these candidates, tell me about how you affected change in a business and in an environment that you worked in. What are some of the skill sets you think are essential from change management and technology adoption? I think that can be absolutely be applied to advisors today on looking at the hundreds of solutions that are out there identifying which ones would be best suited to the objectives of the firm, but also have that champion and that individual Mm. that can move forward and affect change and rally the troops and get everybody on board to have confidence that it's going to be uncomfortable to get rid of my old habits. I love doing the ways and the things that I used to do, but I understand that we are all unified in moving towards a common goal. And the firm needs that type of person or a small group of people that can be leaders for that. 
Yeah, it's interesting because just a couple. I think of a couple of things. First of all, I am in that ten percent of the change agent because, well, then again, I spend most of my time, half my time in the planning sphere, and half my time in the business. And tech is part of that. And I, I will say the one thing is that when I think I, you'll agree to this, when that ten percent is found, because it is the guy at the top or the woman at the top pushing it down. There's no putting up with non-acceptance of these sort of things. Like the the staff basically knows they have to just stop complaining and do it. But it is, a, I mean, and you're talking about firms, right? Firms of a certain size, they have the privilege of being able to find a body to, to do that. When it's smaller, there's still, I'm sure you're not doing a lot of consultations on single advisor shops. It's a challenge, right? We have to be the balancing act of all these things. But I would also say that if that's the case, don't bite off more than you can chew. Like one thing at a time. Do not worry about reinventing the entire widget all the time. Do not worry about having 15 different systems to integrate all this. Focus on scaling the business with a couple of tools to leverage before you go building this massive platform. Right? That is correct. That is correct. And yep. to follow on to that, the individual advisors, solo advisors, or the two partner advisors, there are tremendous resources available. Being a member of the XY Planning Network is a great resource, Absolutely. a great way to leverage and benefit from thousands of other members that operate in a similar situation to, that you might be operating. The Garrett Planning Network is also a great knowledge base of practitioners that many of whom operate a solo business. Also, I think the Alliance of Comprehensive Planners is another group, again, that is predominantly populated by some of the solo and two-person owner advisors. So there's some three great networks already where you can find tremendous resources to operate in that capacity. But you're right. The questions that I have do skew to firms that are a bit larger, but not huge, right? We're talking six people, seven people, a couple staff, yeah couple owner advisors and a couple, maybe a pair of planner or two, but it's at that stage where the technology changes cause more waves in the lake and more commotion and involves lots of uh, multiple people doing, wearing lots of hats. And so it's important to have some a rodeo wrangler, if you will, or a cat herder. That's from the yep. Silicon Valley days is herding cats to yep. make sure that the decisions are being made effectively, that you're communicating of what is going to happen and the status of what's going on and also reinforcing the outcomes that everybody's working towards. Yep. And I will, it's interesting that at that stage, those firms are already starting to have to specialize, right? When you are two or three people, you probably have the administrative assistant, you have the planner, you have the reception, maybe the para planner, whatever it is. But when you start getting to like six, seven, eight, then you're starting to have people who are like, okay, well, you're really good at the investment part, or you're really good at the state planning part, or you're the you're starting to you're starting to build out niches within the firm or specialization. So this is just another stretch of the next the next leap of, of basically buying bringing in another skill set. One that's not traditional to the space, but one that's becoming vital. And you know, I don't know who said it, but the saying goes that in the future there won't be two types of companies: tech companies and dead companies. And the reality is, I even get annoyed when I hear the term tech as an industry because it sure, but look at Domino's Pizza and how much tech is employed there, right? The, the reality is is that we're all slowly becoming te the technologies in the world, right? So we all need to learn to adapt to that. And, and I'm going to make uh, one comment about all the networks you mentioned, all of them incredibly valuable, fantastic. Although I live in Canada, we don't have any of those. <laughs> Although we're uh, slowly at the, hopefully the impetus of some of them starting to, starting to be come together. So, but yes, hugely valuable, wherever possible, leverage the resources of people in the same mindset and the same place. So that's the now, let's talk about the future. So how do you see the things, and you get, you get the privilege of seeing a lot of early stage uh, development, because I'm sure you get asked by many of the tech companies for feedback. Fast forward the clock, five, six, seven years, where do you see the biggest changes between day-to-day -day life for an advisor today and, and in that part, in that place in the future? So if I put my thinking hat on or my crystal ball, we yeah. have video here, Jason and I, but I don't have a crystal yeah. ball behind me on my bookshelf. You're yeah. missing that. You need that one of those on your shelf. Yeah, I do. I need the FP pad crystal ball. But that aside, I do feel that we, the financial professional profession can benefit by the aggregation of insight across millions of households. And so it, it sometimes pains me to think about some of the financial planning solutions that are available today where I'm an advisor and Jason, you come to me with your household and you'd like to prepare for your financial future. So I do a lot of data intake and I run it through my financial plan. I, I go file new and I create a new plan for Jason in your household. I ingest the data. I do my number crunching and it creates this one page or 60 page, depending on what software you're using. Or how much you want to give them, but yes. Yes, this financial yeah. plan output, and it has all the inflation estimates, your cash flow estimates, 
your current investments, your liabilities. We know what we're talking about. And then I go to the top corner of my desktop. And when I'm finished with your engagement, I go file close and that's it. So where I'm going with this is your plan exists in a silo. And yeah. if I'm a business owner, I might work with a hundred households. Well, I have a hundred files for my financial plans. Each one I operate and update independently. So fast forward five years, I don't want my plans to live in silos. I want all hundred plans to communicate with one another. And Jason, I want to be able to open up conceptually 30 other households who are just like you or uh -huh. 70% like you. Their income level is very similar to you. Two children in the household, maybe parents, both of whom are alive and require assistance and maybe some financial assistance as well as time assistance, so on and so forth. I want to be able to leverage the insights from a firm perspective that we've created across many, many households. And then let's think even beyond that. Well, what about the planner in Toronto? What about the planner in Vancouver? What about the planners in San Francisco and Atlanta? What are they doing for households that are like Jason and Jason's household? Let me get some insights from that. I'm not able to dive into planner in San Francisco into one plan specifically and look at all the numbers. I'm, I don't need that level of detail. But on the whole, on the aggregate, mm -hmm. What are the assumptions? What are some of the trends that we're seeing out there? I would like to see within five years, financial planning software specifically being able to use those types of insights, not across 100 households for one advisory firm, but potentially hundreds of thousands of households and be able to create those Venn diagrams of, okay, yeah. Jason is a new client to me and we create a Venn diagram and I found a bunch of other households that share characteristics that are about 80%. 85% close. And of course, there's always going to be nuances and differences that don't apply to your household, mm -hmm. just to someone else's household. But by and large, the 80% is taken care of. So fast track me on the 80%. You know, right? Give me some insights that are very common across hundreds or thousands of these households. And that's just, I don't know, boilerplate's a bad word for it, but it is presents boilerplate type of management and recommendations of what to do with investments and insurance coverage. But I need to focus, Jason, on your pinball business. I need to understand what the economics are of your pinball business, your capital outlay, your return on investment, the value of that, if you're going to sell it in the future, or if you're going to give it to your children as adult children operating, right? That's the little 10 to 15% that I can focus on that it's unique to you. And there's nobody else operating a pinball business out of these thousands of plans that we're talking about. That's where I would really like to see things go. And you may correct me, but I don't think anybody is doing anything like that today. No, it's interesting. Yeah. I mean, I've seen machine learning and artificial intelligence thrown at planning. I mean, what you're talking about there almost sounds like crowdsource benchmarking or crowdsource validation of, of strategies, which I think is would be fascinating. And I mean, not beyond the realm of what's possible given the next generation softwares I see out there, being able to aggregate all that and, you know, simply almost like planning nudges to basically say like, hey, 80% of the clients who fit this profile are not doing X, they're doing Y and even extrapolate as to what the difference is. I think nudging advisors, because it's, it's interesting you say that and I'm going down a rabbit hole on this. I'm sure you've read the paper on the, mis, um, oh, was it the misconceptions or the, the improper beliefs of financial advisors, how we basically a lot of times it's not just bad advice that gets given out, but sometimes it's like bad advice that we believe and we do it in our own portfolios at the same time. So I'm butchering the name of it, but there's a paper about that, how advisors aren't being malicious with bad advice. They just, they truly believe that. And they're going to believe that in an echo chamber until they're proven otherwise wrong, right? So the ability to be able to take the crowdsourced, and as we know, the wisdom of crowds, crowds typically get the answer right. The crowdsourced data from, from tons of financial advisors and aggregate that into a best practice, almost the best practices is a compelling offering I hadn't heard yet. So this is and, unique. And see, this is happening uh. today because I witness it. This happens on Twitter. A, an advisor will put up a <laughs> generic scenario of what do you think the right amount of umbrella coverage is or this closely held business? What do you think it value is? You know, some of these anonymous or anonymized questions and 25 other advisors kind of chime in and say, yeah. hey, you know, we typically recommend this. I see it on Facebook groups, on private Facebook groups. Planners yep. are posting these scenarios mm -hmm. of insurance or estate planning or whatever. And you get 25 advisors responding with how they've done this in the past. Now, what we are talking about is take it away 
from the disparate, unstructured data, which is Facebook groups and Facebook replies, and let's put it towards structured data, things that software does extremely well, provide a framework, a structure, a way to index it, and then extract mm-hmm. these insights of, oh, okay, Jason runs a pinball business. It generates $250,000 in gross revenue every year, blah, blah, blah. Other businesses like this need this type of continuity insurance or business interruption insurance. And by the way, these other hundred other business owners generally use this one seller of insurance policies because they give a great price. And it's like, um, how much hours and thought did that just save? It's kind of like the next door of financial planning. You go to next door to find yeah. good plumbers and good yeah. air conditioning contractors for the right price, but apply that type of crowdsourcing and group knowledge towards yeah. financial planning recommendations. And that's not saying that we're going to end up in a homogenous solution for everything, because again, there's it's not really going to capture 100% of that client dynamic. So it may work for 80% of people out there, but there's something specific about this client that's never going to be captured in the software that says it's never going to happen. But it's a good point of consideration and even a good point of due diligence just to simply say, like, we didn't do X because of Y. So before I'm cognizant of time here, so I want to move on to something else. And we, this is a, we had this preliminary conversation. Piece of advice you want to give advisors as to how they should be spending their time. And it's not what people are expecting from a technologist, but what do you think they should be spending their time on these days? I think the advisor should be spending their time figuring out how they're going to grow their business or engage clients and engage prospects very effectively. We are recording this in September of 2020. Basically, mm-hmm. you're six months into a global pandemic, which has totally disrupted and totally turned how advisors operate completely upside down. Many of us are still practicing social distancing and not hosting any meetings, face-to-face meetings of any kind. And all of us have been forced to get into remote and video chat platforms and some asynchronous communication, but also synchronous communication, sometimes using video chat platforms where appropriate, although a lot of us are Mm -hmm. really suffering from that Zoom fatigue or the online video fatigue. But in the right circumstances, the video chat is very beneficial in terms of communication. Mm -hmm. But there's other types of ways to interact and engage with clients. And so where your question is leading me is, I firmly believe that advisors and everyone inside the business really needs to develop a new skill set on how to communicate using remote technology or online hosted based technology, video chats, podcasts, if you will. Some of that Mm -hmm. is synchronous, like what you and I are doing. We have our video on, even though our listeners don't see the video. Jason Mm -hmm. can see me like put my finger up, like I have something to add here. He can see me, my head explode emoji, (laughs) right? When we're talking about this crazy thing of financial planning forecasting. So we have that ability to still have that type of unspoken rapport, that body language, if you will. But there's also asynchronous options, you know, things like Slack messaging or Microsoft Teams messaging, where you can get your team on board and do this asynchronous communication and team building, but not depend on email, which is horrible for asynchronous type of communication. Terrible. It's the worst form of communication ever developed. But for the advisory firm, think about you need new skills in developing content, whether it's synchronous content or asynchronous content. And think about ways to provide value for your clients as well as engage prospects. It can be video content. It can be podcast content. A lot of us have been talking about even blog posts and information Mm -hmm. that is relevant to clients and advisors. And Jason, I know you and I have talked about other uh, solution providers or tech companies that have embraced this really well and are doing a great job of engaging financial professionals with respect to education and information. And kind of a second order effect is marketing those types of tech solutions. They are doing a great job and they're to be followed and they are good examples of Well, again, what our listeners are thinking of is, okay, how do I embrace this huge change in the world and how do I make lemonade out of it and develop new skill sets and do things that are good for my clients and good for my business? That's just it. And I mean, if your old methodology of growing your business was to personally network with people, that's going to be a challenge uh, going forward. Holding public events is going to be a challenge, right? But you can move a lot of that into the online realm and you can do so highly effectively. But and as I said to you, one of the things I love about content marketing is that there's a, there's a cost of entry and that cost of entry is the advisor's time and thinking around the actual marketing or the actual generation of content, which is a time commitment in itself. And I will say that, and you know, we talked about content providers, couple of things I will say to help people in this regard. Michael Kitsis does a wonderful job with his fintech map that does identify several marketing technology companies. I also have a Canadian version of something similar recently launched. 
And the last one that deserves the most credit is uh, Samantha over 20 over 10 with her blog. And if you want to know how to market your business digitally, that is the place you start. There is tons of content there that will help you. So um, there's lots of resources out there for those who are intimidated, but I, I'll echo Bill's, uh, Bill's advice. Start thinking of moving your communication to the new paradigm of, of digital. Because if not, it's going to be tough going for the next little while. That's true. We don't know what the future holds, but no. one thing that is certain is advisors can get new skills. The firm as a whole can get new skills. And if they are aligned, if they have a total purpose in mind, I think that everyone, again, can rally together and make this happen and do something good with this opportunity. Excellent. So before we wrap up, I have three questions I ask everybody to get you thinking. First one, and then a positive note, hopefully. First question is, if you had one wish for something to change in your firm or the business as a whole, the industry as a whole, what would it be? I would love to see lower costs and a proliferation of planning engagements for clients of all stripes. So I've been a firm believer in uh -huh. technology and applying it to businesses and financial planning businesses specifically that I would like to see millions of households in North America Canada, United States, and, and more. I would like to see millions and millions of households be able to engage planners in affordable engagements and get fantastic plans and advice and recommendations, again, at a price that they can afford because it is powered by technology. I hope that we see, and we're seeing this with Vanguard and Charles Schwab, the price point of getting a financial plan is decreasing and the numbers of households that can go through this process is increasing. I really hope that it continues to grow and explode. And if your firm has the option and opportunity to participate in this trend as well, I highly encourage it. I would love to see this happen on a mass scale. Great. It's interesting. I've written articles in the past about how so many decisions are based around what we can take and what is based around overhead. What is the overhead of running the firm in order to basically bring on, bring on a client? Therefore, that drives how big a client has to be or how much they have to pay in order to make them profitable, right? And the most deflationary power we've seen in human existence has been technology. And if as long as we can keep on utilizing technology and moving more towards new paradigms of highly digital offerings, we can drive that price point down to what the Schwabs and the vanguards of the world have done. And again, we'll go back to XY and now we can and mention them specifically specifically for engineering a overhead structure that was meant to be low costs to expand the pool of people that service can be offered to. Not innovation, as someone speaking from a, what I'll call a high overhead country, definitely a trend that we need to see happen around the world because the power of good advice is, is life-changing. Second question, what has been the biggest challenge in getting to where you are today? Pause Stop for you. dramatic effect. I stump people with at least one of these three questions every time. You answered, the, usually it's the wish one that they, stu they get stumped on, but <laughs> you stumped here. So ask me again. I need to hear it one more time. Okay. So second question, what has been the biggest challenge in getting to where you are today? Jason, this is, you stumped me on this question. What is, <laughs> and, and that's good. I think that's what you're yeah. going for. What that's is fantastic. The biggest, what is the biggest challenge when I reflect on basically 24 years plus or minus of my career progression, I don't see obstacles. I don't see defeat. Even if I've had moments where I don't feel like I'm successful, I learned from that experience. I tried to take what I've learned and use that as a valuable teaching opportunity. I've take, I, mean, I don't take risks, but I've done a lot of different things. When I did FP pad, it's because I couldn't find on the internet and on blogs, which was this emerging thing, I found no resources that were useful to me. So I made them. In 2013, no one was doing video content around financial advisors and technology. So I went and I did that. And I'm now working on more content development and creative content. And I see a lot of opportunities to move into that space. And so I'm just doing it. But that's because yes. I've been operating for 24 years. I've made good saving decisions, right? And good choices to grow over those 24 years. And so it didn't happen overnight. It's like that iceberg of illusion. I've got this huge iceberg underneath the waterline of conservative choices, saving every year to get me into this position where if I want to grow into something, I'm going to just go ahead and do it. Although I, I'm still conservative, I don't take huge risks and take out a lot of debt and financing to do something on a grand scale. So I do operate with conservatism, but I just don't 
I can't highlight some of those struggles that are things that I feel like I failed to overcome. So I, I hope that that addresses your question. No, it's an answer. I mean, I think, I think I, I share a similar mindset to you in that it's just, it's a speed bump. You get past it, right? And you're out there saying, I can't find a solution. I'm just going to create this solution. That is a mindset that I very much <laughs> understand and share. And I will say that that type of work that you've done has been inspiring to guys like me to basically say, okay, there's definitely a market for something like this. And at least there's one guy, one or two people out there doing it. And let me see if I can add a voice to that perspective. So um, and to that point, and to, to kind of finish this, if you do it for yourself, you know that there's a market of one. And then what exactly. are the odds with the internet that you can engage 7 billion people? What are the odds that there are other people that have similar needs to you. So if you do it for yourself and you answer your own issues and questions and then put it out there, it is easier today than it has ever been before to find your tribe and to work together for common solutions. 100%. So last question for you before we wrap up, what excites you the most about what it is you're working on and keeps you getting up out of bed every morning to keep on fighting the good fight? I'm excited about the opportunity to capture real passion for work. So what I've discovered in financial planning, financial services, but also some of the other work that I'm doing in other industries. If you look on my personal YouTube channel on uh, Bill Winterberg at YouTube, I've taken these epic summer road trips in my little 19 foot travel trailer and created a lifetime's worth of memories on these road trips, seeing national parks and great places in America. I have a passion to share that not only just with my family to create our own memories, but imagine if hundreds of thousands of other families are inspired to do something similar with their time and with their resources. But also other industries like, you know, I'm doing some work with uh, charity fundraising with bicycling events and also healthcare professionals. When you engage professionals on all levels in all sorts of industries, you find those who are truly dedicated and passionate about what it is they do and why they get up in the morning to do what they do. And with my video content, I'm now able to capture that passion. I'm able to capture their stories and edit that together in a video that we're putting on YouTube, we put on a private site, maybe we put it on your about page for your business. And other people see that and it's like, look, we've got the internet, we got 7 billion people that we can direct message on Twitter or something like that. So There's no problem finding somebody, but the problem is, can you find somebody who exudes passion for what they do? And if you can find that piece of content, that Twitter feed, that video on YouTube, that they're just, they love doing this and they live and breathe it. And especially that can be true for many financial professionals. And I'd have to say Uh it is not true for all financial professionals. There are many professionals out there that all they want to do is crush the S&P every year and flout their performance. And I guess that's fine. (laughs) And people are going to look for that. That's fine. But if I want to have that serious conversation about why I save money and what I choose to spend my money on for personal fulfillment and household fulfillment, I think I want to meet somebody and engage in somebody who is extremely passionate about that and is not interested in telling me about his or her portfolio performance, but rather understanding who I am and how our household operates and be able to apply their wisdom, knowledge, and recommendations to that. And so for me to be able to capture that in video form, in content form, and share that in a meritocracy fashion, that's what gets me out of the bed in the morning. Fantastic answer. Bill, thank you so much for taking the time today. Very much appreciated. Thank you. It's been a pleasure. So I hope you enjoyed my interview with Bill Winterberg. I know I did. And please, if you have yet to check him out, please check out FPPAT and his YouTube channel. And as always, if you enjoyed this podcast, please leave a review on iTunes, Stitcher, or wherever you get your podcast. Until next time, take care. This podcast was brought to you by Woodgate Financial, an award-winning financial planning firm catering to high net worth individuals and their families. To learn more, go to woodgate.com. You can subscribe to this podcast on iTunes, Stitcher, and Google Play, or find more episodes.